OK, so let's go ahead and get started. So thank you for coming. Uh, this is the panel on application portability, of course. Uh, my name is Everett Taves. I'm a developer advocate at Rackspace. And I'm also a project management committee and committer on Apache JClouds. JClouds is a multi-cloud Java SDK that works across Amazon, Google, uh, OpenStack, Rackspace, HP. And so it's, one of its purposes is to enable application portability. And I'd like to introduce you now to our fine panelists here, I guess starting with the man with the mic. I'm George Russo, I'm uh, the former CTO of Instratius, which was acquired by Dell a few months ago. So now I'm a director there and uh, uh, focused on uh, multi-cloud management and applications across multiple clouds. Randy Bias, CEO of Cloud Scaling, a longtime cloud guy, both building the infrastructure and deploying apps on top of it. I'm uh, Yaron Parasol. I'm VP of Product Management for uh, Gigaspaces. Uh, we have uh, Cloudify, a product that orchestrates and manage uh, application of our different clouds and heavily uses uh, JClouds. Hi, my name is uh, Hunter Neild. I'm with uh, Morph Labs. And um, my experience is really uh, along the lines of using the uh, uh, Fog library and contributing that uh, a lot of the code that came around through uh, Essex um, and uh, improving that over time to, to really enable movement between clouds on uh, the Ruby side. Cool. Thanks a lot. OK, so I think there are many aspects to application portability. There's API network topology, um, you know, cloud provider capabilities, even billing could be considered in application portability, and you know, the kinds of images that are available on the various clouds as well. So I invite you to start thinking about your questions across those aspects or others, and you know, kind of work, uh, work it down to a question you can get out in you know, at least 30 seconds or so. And I'm going to start things off here with a bit of a softball, <laughs> just to warm us up, that, you know, is application portability across different clouds, whether it's public or private, I mean, is it really a practical concern? Is it, is it achievable? What have been your experiences actually porting applications between clouds? Uh, I think it's actually a very difficult problem, and I don't think there's necessarily a simple solution at the moment. I mean, I think we do have, you know, a lot of good libraries out there like Fog and like JClouds that are really helping enable, um, you know, sort of a common uh, compatibility layer. But there's certain things that are really not, um, you know, helping or, or easy to do um, when you're dealing with applications in the various different levels of complexity and, and uh, features that are provided across the clouds. So uh, I. I agree that uh, it's not an easy task. Uh, we've been doing that. We've been dealing with that for the last uh, two years or so. Uh, I think it goes much beyond API, and there are some uh, things that you must uh, follow if you want to have uh, cloud application portability. So one of them, I think uh, your application code should not be familiar at all. It should be completely decoupled from the cloud. Otherwise, uh, there is no chance for uh, portability unless it's a one-time exercise and then you spend a lot of effort and it might happen. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't consider that particular aspect uh, part of application portability if you're like you're picking a whole thing up and, and moving it over entirely. Exactly. It's, I mean, that's more of a migration than, than a port. Exactly. So we're talking about other use cases such as VR or cloud bursting and hybrid clouds. All of those use cases, you can, you can sum them up as a hybrid cloud. They have different flavors. So I think one, one, uh, one rule of thumb would be to decouple your application completely uh, from, from the underlying environment. And so for the application, the cloud should be nothing more than the operating system, in, in my opinion. And uh, then if you want to consider using uh, some layer of abstraction, it should be one aspect of your application. So it should be 
uh, concentrated in, in one place. And even in that case, uh, jCloud would do a great job, but uh, would not cover all. Uh, it's, it's not going to provide you with 100% uh, compatibility. So you'll always have to go to a certain extent to the native API. And so if you're doing it with one aspect, it becomes much less of a painful exercise. It's uh, much more practical. There are other aspects, but I'll let other people speak. Well, so I don't think, first off, you can, you can separate out application migration. I think application migration is a use case for, for um, application portability. You can't have uh, application migrations, uh, or at least in an automated fashion, unless you've got a portable application. Uh, you know, there, there are many different elements depending on what you're trying to do with your application. Uh, you don't have to fully decouple your application from uh, the underlying cloud. You can, for example, uh, use Amazon RDS and have, you know, mechanisms in place uh, so that um, you're not necessarily relying on RDS if you want to be, uh, have that application port to other clouds. Um, if you want to do some sort of automated migration, then you need orchestration on top of that. Uh, but one of the, I guess, the important things is that, um, you know, people, there, a, a lot of reasons this comes up in the context of OpenStack is because first and foremost, a lot of people originally got excited about OpenStack as if it were going to be the thing that delivered portability between clouds. Um, it, and OpenStack no more does that than VMware does that between VMware clouds. Uh, the, and, and there are complicating factors within OpenStack. Um, you know, sometimes I'll, 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 I'll say that uh, OpenStack isn't compatible with itself, and uh, you know that creates uh, problems just within OpenStack. Uh, and then the other thing is, 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 you know, people look to API standardization as maybe some sort of magic uh, tool, you know, but uh, um, library, you know, and, and I actually uh, have written, and it's part of the uh, multi-cloud manager and Stratus product, uh, Java abstraction library for clouds, Dasein Cloud, uh, that, you know, you can write against that uh, and work against any cloud, but that still doesn't give you application portability. So if we solve the API issue, we still don't get application portability because I think the secret to being able to operate uh, an application in any cloud is really to first and foremost start with best practices around developing share nothing horizontally scalable distributed applications. The, 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 the nuances of APIs and images and stuff are secondary concerns. Um, not to plug myself, but I'm going to. I went into this topic on hybrid cloud on Tuesday during the AWS repatriation talk I gave. The video is up. You should go look at that, because I'm probably going to repeat a lot of what I said there, and that's going to have more detail. Um, I think that this is really simple. Um, you know, if you want to solve the application portability problem, you have to accept the fact that uh, all systems, especially cloud systems, are basically have three key components. At the top, you've got the API. In the middle, you've got semantics combined with architecture. And at the bottom, you have behavior. And what I mean by that is that when I say spin up a VM on cloud A and I say spin up a VM on cloud B, they need to do the same thing. They need to have the same behavior. If on cloud A, the VM spins up in five minutes, and if on cloud B, it spins up in 60 minutes, I have a problem because when I design my application deployment and management framework on cloud A, it assumed that VMs come up in five minutes or it takes action. When I go and I run that on cloud B, it doesn't behave the same way. And it doesn't matter what, IP, what APIs are in place, the problem is that the behavior has to be the same. And that's why when you look at conformance tests, they test the behavior of an API or a system. They don't just test the API itself. And I think the thing that people really get stuck on is that they think about the APIs, they think about abstraction layers, and what they don't realize is that the application is not running in a vacuum. The infrastructure it runs on matters. The behavior of the infrastructure matters. 
OpenStack Cloud A, I have floating IPs with auto assignment. OpenStack Cloud B, I have no floating uh, IPs with auto assignment. And so now when my framework on A is basically designed to assume that every VM that spins up has an IP, when I take it to OpenStack Cloud B, it breaks. And that's the fundamental problem. We have to come up with some reference architectures, and then we need to be able to test them so each flavor of OpenStack behaves the same way. And then application portability between those flavors will actually work. OK, so it sounds to me like, obviously, there's no silver bullet. And I don't think anyone was coming here expecting to get a silver bullet for application portability. Um, and it is the kind of thing that you need to, I would say, consider almost upfront, um, if possible. If you're building a cloud-native application and you don't want to be locked in, it's, you know, you got to give some thought to application portability upfront. Do we have any questions from the audience? Would anybody like to? Pick the brains of our panel here. Sure. Oh, just wait. We'll have. Uh, we'll get your mic there. Um, I didn't have a question, but I had a follow-up comment on the discussion on the application portability. Um, yeah. So, as you said, uh, portability, application portability, is a really hard problem, especially when you are talking about portability between different kinds of cloud. For example, OpenStack to AWS. It's a very different and very complex game. Um, it's hard enough. Uh, I think it's a more uh, achievable uh, target is to achieve portability within clouds of the same nature. For example, portability between different OpenStack clouds from different vendors or between uh, private or public OpenStack. If we achieve that as a step one, that would be a huge win uh, from a practical portability uh, perspective. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, I, that's not exactly true, though. My, that's my point, right, is that I can, I can take OpenStack and I can make it look exactly like Amazon Web Services. I can make it behave almost identically. That's my product. That's what I did, right? I can take two versions of OpenStack and I can make them behave completely differently, right? The problem is in the behavior of the clouds themselves. It's not in the software stacks. If you look at Google Compute Engine and you look at Amazon Web Services, they're 95% semantically, architecturally, and behaviorally overlapping. It's very, very easy to port an application from one to the other. Uh, you support both of those, right, George? So and how easy is it to take a deployment on the multi-cloud manager and deploy that same deployment on, both, on either Amazon or Google and have it act the same? Those are easy. It's, it's when you try to take something. It, it, to your point, from Amazon to, to, to like IBM Smart Cloud, which is completely indeterministic in, in how long it, it could take two minutes to deploy, to, to deploy a VM. It could take literally 24 hours uh, for a VM to deploy. And it's one of the reasons it's going bye-bye, I guess. But, uh, um, you know, but, but the point, to Randy's point, is that if you've got, um, you know, orchestration logic that times out after 15 minutes, then you can't rely on smart cloud as f being a functional cloud, period, the end, and, and, and application portability goes out the window. Whereas if you've got Amazon and Google and they have same behavioral semantics, who cares that the APIs are completely different? That, those are, that, that's a completely irrelevant uh, issue. It's that you can rely on them having the same behavioral characteristics. OK. Yeah. So <clears throat> given the fact that we can agree no cloud is ever going to perform exactly the same between multiple different vendors, for the mission of providing application portability, do you think it would be better if uh, there were an abstraction layer similar to the Google App Engine that everyone could agree upon? And so for the purposes of app development, Develop, develop your app against that abstraction where something you know below that handles the distribution and portability. I, so, so I, sorry, just to clarify, are we are you kind of suggesting or, or talking about platform as a service effectively? Similar, well, not exactly platform as a service. What I because it's that's a little bit different. What I mean is actually a way of uh, if you look at Google, Google App Engine, not Compute Engine, but the App Engine. When you develop an app against that, you literally put it into the cloud, and the whole idea is that it abstracts the access to the, to the database behind it and everything else, so you have a common set of tools that would, in theory, if the, if the abstraction worked properly on different clouds, it would provide the same set of resources. So, so 
the, it shouldn't be taken from the fact that, you know, uh, so we put this, you know, Google and Amazon behave alike, good, smart cloud, different, bad. And, and that, that's not necessarily a good breakdown because different clouds should behave differently. Otherwise, they add no, you know, value. No, I uh, agree. And, and so, and so um, you know, when you look at it from an individual application perspective, an individual application requires certain performance characteristics. Now, in some cases, um, the best way to deal with that is to leverage a, a pass like a Google App Engine. In other cases, the best way to deal with it is to leverage an orchestration tool like a multi-cloud manager or any of the, the competitors that are going to, that, that will worry about the behavioral similarities of different clouds for you so that you don't have to. So, you know, the, the, so orchestration is another way to get similar, uh, a guarantee of similar performance characteristics across different clouds. So uh, I definitely agree about the orchestration and uh, not about the PaaS because, uh, first of all, PaaS is quite simplistic. It's a black box model. Uh, usually it doesn't uh, suit many applications, many mission critical applications. Um, and if you look at the um, uh, Java application servers as an example for, let's say, previous generation uh, kind of application portability experiment, it never worked. So even with Java, that uh, I think a lot of people would agree that uh, if you write once, you can run it anywhere, uh, at least from API perspective. Even the JDKs, the, the, the IBM implementation and the Sun implementation never work this quite the same way, but more than that, the different containers never worked in a, in a fashion that uh, you could have a port an enterprise application from one application server to, to the other without any effort. Uh, I would say that uh, I tried it a few times and it was quite painful. Hunter, did you have anything to add? Um, I think there's probably, you know, the, the biggest issue I think that we're sort of all really talking about here is a, you know, a consistency in that behavior. And um, if we're, you know, really needing to look at uh, the consistency you see in terms of uh, launch time or in terms of functionality that's being provided by a cloud, then that's, um, you may not be able to abstract all of those sorts of things out of there into a platform container or, or, or anything else. So either it's a, it's a means of or finding a way that you know, in understanding your application and, and seeing those requirements that are actually going through there that you know, having to be able to choose to you know, those providers that we actually be using is still a very fundamental part of it. Do we have another question over here? Randy's got something to say. Oh, sure. And I, then we'll, maybe I, we'll I, move I the mic to do. the back. Yeah, so I, I, I got to call bullshit on some of this. I mean, the reality is, is that there's only going to be a few flavors of cloud, right? I mean, imagine if every power company provided you a different kind of power. Like, you'd be totally screwed, right? I mean, look at the diversity of applications that consume electricity. The reason there's a diversity of, 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 of applications and, and use cases is because the electrical system is standardized. It's because of that. You have to have standardization at the bottom. That's why the highway system works. That's why TCP IP works, right? What's the level of interoperability between any two load balancers, right? It's crap, right? But what's the level of interoperability between two IP routers? It's very, very good. The reality is, is that over time, we're going to have standardization occur at the infrastructure layer that's the only way to make this stuff work. And behavioral co copying behavior is really not as hard as it seems. It's, it's a task, but let me give you an example. How many people are familiar with Android? OK. How many people know that Android runs something called Davlik, which is their virtual machine that's a replacement for Java? How many people know that it is 100% bytecode compatible with Java? It's a complete and utter copy of the Java virtual machine behaviorally and API. 
and Java code runs on it natively with no problems. And there's no way that Google can just rip off the source code. They had to rewrite the thing from scratch, measure the behavior of the Java VM, and recreate it. And that's how you do it. That's how you make it happen. So then we just have to decide what are the reference models? Is it AWS and Google Compute Engine? Is it vCloud Director? Um, is it you know some other thing? I think you know where my bet is already. So maybe just a, a, a quick, quick answer. Some opponents are 50 amps. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. The behavior is fundamentally the same. No, it, it's not. And if I go back to your metaphor of uh, power, electric power, so the interface would be the same, right? It's the same socket that you're using. It's the same voltage. But um, first of all, it's quite a simplistic uh, service compared to, I, I would say, compared to enterprise applications. And from SLA perspective, I would claim that uh, different uh, vendors would not give you the same, S the same SLA even with electricity and there were a lot of problems with uh, uh, power offs, I think especially in California and other places where they have uh, different uh, vendors providing electricity, they had problems with that because you, you cannot rely on some companies to provide the same quality of, uh, um, you know, uh, production of electricity as, as other companies. So it will be the same thing with uh, with a cloud. A cloud is a virtualized data center in a large scale. It's a very complex operation. You, you can never make it uh, be exactly the same. Even the same code stack, like OpenStack, when, when one company operates it and another company, a different company operates it, it's different hardware, different people, it will always be different. It absolutely will not. One deployment of open cloud system, my OpenStack product, looks exactly like the other one. Exactly. 100% down to the nuts and bolts, regardless of the hardware actually used under it. And if you're talking about the California power outages in like 2000, 2001, those had nothing to do with the transmission system. They were directly related to Enron and the deregulation of the power industry and the inability of the power companies to actually buy power. If you look at the way the power works, it actually operates within a fairly narrow range, and it's very standardized. So an interesting tangent. Maybe we'll uh, <laughs> head, head back to a question in the back here. Uh, sorry, we have the Hello. gentleman back here first. So Randy, people are going to buy solutions other than yours <laughs> No way. In, in addition to yours, right? So, so how do you get other people on the same page as you as far as showing behavior dynamics? Is, is there some sort of behavioral description language that shows SLAs? Or what, what are you thinking as far as kind of getting everybody on the same page? Yeah, that's a great question. So the way I look at it right now is that OpenStack is a framework. You can use it to build any kind of system. That's great. Some people are going to use it to build HPC clouds, right? Party on. Go do that. So what we need to do is we need to start thinking of the different sort of flavors of OpenStack, that's what I mean, that solve specific problems, right? What Argonne National Labs is doing with OpenStack, which is all on InfiniBand, is quite different than what you and I are doing with OpenStack, right? So my flavor is what I call Elastic Cloud. It's meant to be, look like Amazon and Google, but there's other completely legitimate flavors. And so we need to have, uh, there's a project right now called RefStack that's trying to have a set of Tempest tests that can do basic conformance testing of sort of one of these kind of flavors. And so what we need to do is we need to start adding more and more tests in there, and we need to figure out what the handful or a dozen of different flavors are. And then the marketplace and customer adoption will cause you know, some of these to succeed or not. And then you know, OpenStack will still be standing tall because it is flexible. So are we kind of talking about the emergence of a de facto behavioral standard with the ref stack and the testing? Yeah. Is that I mean, that, that's what it does right now. Ref stack and Tempest test, test the EC2 behavior, for example, as well as the OpenStack behavior in the system. They do things like spin up a virtual machine, make sure it comes up, make sure it's got networking. But it also does the timing on that as well. I don't know if that's currently a test or not, but that's, that's an example of the kind of tests that need to be added to expand the testing in the current systems. Sure. I don't want to bogart the No, point. yeah, yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> Anybody want to expand, or we'll take another question here? Um, it's, we'll leave that mic up here, if we could. Just a moment. Um, 
I think we need to, uh, Randy, this is uh, actually as a response to you. I tend to agree with him that, you know, uh, there can be differences. What, what I mean by that is, we could say, hey, look, all, all these OpenStack implementations are similar, but we have to bear in mind that that's just the API. The underlying hypervisor itself, when that changes, and I see us forgetting that a lot, we all talk about moving to OpenStack, whereas we're just moving to the OpenStack API, and the underlying hypervisors can be different. And we all know from experience that you know each hypervisor has its own plus and minuses, depending on the distros and everything. So if you were to run an application on, say, Ubuntu you know, based uh, VMs, and they per work a particular way, Tomorrow, when you move over to, let's say, Red Hat's KVM, that has to be tweaked and tuned in a different way. So even when you're migrating your app, even between KVM but from different vendors, you'll have to pay a bit of attention there. Okay, so OpenStack API would be the same, but your application now starts to... And your question is? And, and my, my point is that when you talk about app portability, you, you have to bear in mind that, you know, uh, it's not enough that just the, uh, the API behavior is the same. Your application performance characteristics will vary depending on the yeah. underlying flavor. Part of the performance is part of the behavior. So it does vary. You cannot say that it will be the same. Yes, performance is a subset of behavior. Uh, so here's, here's, so I, I think that you do want different clouds that have different perform behavioral characteristics for different types of applications. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, just because they're, you know, provisioning in 24 hours is bad any way you look at it. There's no scenario in which that's what you want. But, you know, you want, you may have a, you know, so, so one of the things, you know, you encounter a lot of times people will say, you know, why do we need to worry about multi-cloud? We're dedicated to OpenStack. Well, you probably don't want, in, a, in an a, a enterprise with thousands of applications, you probably don't want bit one big giant OpenStack. Uh, cloud. You probably want multiples, you want geographic redundancy, and you probably want stuff that have higher performance characteristics, some with more commodity generic ones, and those, that's all good. No applications are not all alike. Uh, the, the, the important thing is to, you know, when you are building a cloud, and, and, and the value proposition of what Randy does is he can give you a cloud where he can tell you what those behavioral characteristics are and you can expect them. And that, that's, a really, um, that's a really important thing to expect out of your clouds. I mean, you know, you look at something like Joyent. Joyent's, uh, um, Joyent doesn't do a lot, but what they do do, they that you can, you, you can predict how they're going to behave and act. And the predictability is the important thing because you can't orchestrate, you can't run a pass, and you can't just plain put an app out there and appreciate how it's going to behave if you can't predict it. If, you, if the provisioning times between two minutes and 24 hours or, you know, you get these I.O. hiccups that last for 10 minutes at a time, randomly out of nowhere, and so on. Yaron or Hunter, any interest in adding to the and behavioral bit? The reality is that I think the, the cloud behavior is not even uh, well defined yet in, in, the, in the API. So for example, network SLA, I, I don't think it's that well defined, affinity, anti-affinity, so. Uh, Yes, yes, exactly, and, and that's a, a major aspect of application portability. So uh, I think the good news for the SI is that they're always going to be work for them. And like I said, I, I, I still think that uh, the application itself cannot take care of that difference, of those differences, and there should be an external tool that inspect that and, and even with dynamic uh, changes throughout time, with peak loads and stuff like that, you need to scale your application, change it according to the performance. The performance may vary. I think just briefly going back, and, and there was sort of a, me uh, a mention of uh, sort of the talk of you know one cloud running Ubuntu and one cloud running uh, you know Red Hat or, or something along those lines, and I think you know that 
you know, adds so much more complexity to the mix and, you know, is obviously avoidable at all costs. But um, I, I think yeah. the comment there was the underlying hypervisor right. uh, and the differences. But there is, I there. mean, the difference is there and, I mean, it's, it's, you know, that's where the, you know, standardization on behavior and, and I think RefStack becomes a really good part of that to, uh, to enable that consistency and, and certainly help out the you know, open stack providers to, to offer something that is actually going to be reasonably consistent um, and whether or not it's going to be performant and offering uh, benchmark testing and, and those sorts of things as well, you know, is probably a very important consideration in this discussion. Let's, uh, let's go back to the audience here. Before I ask my question, I'd actually like to preface it with a couple of statements of assumption. Assuming for a moment that not all of the cloud providers that I'm wanting to write an application for are completely homogenized across each other. And assuming that I am not entirely decoupling everything that my application is doing from whatever cloud I'm wanting to put it on eventually or port it to eventually, what can I as an application developer do to leverage not just the common functionality across all cloud providers, but actually leverage explicit advantages that each cloud provider might provide me? Um, so in particular, uh, for jclouds, I know that we do have uh, some portable abstractions. There's an abstraction layer that does the commonalities across the supported cloud providers. Um, but it actually makes it quite easy to drop down a layer. Uh, it's just another call to get the specific, say, OpenStack API. And you can start making OpenStack specific calls and then if there happens to be some you know, very specific cloud provider functionality, even within the OpenStack ecosystem, you can take yet another step down, just another call, and you can get a hold of that, the handle on the API for that very specific functionality. Um, but, or follow up? Uh, following up on that a little bit, is there, is there anything in existence right now that would let me as an application developer be able to reference the common functionality trivially, but also request from what, what, what is provided, what cloud it is that I am on, and based on that, selectively. So, so you're talking a bit about like discoverability of what, what features that the cloud is providing? To essentially ask, what cloud am I on, and based on that, if I'm on Amazon, if I'm on an Amazon cloud, then I know that I can improve, improve my performance by making these additional calls. If I'm, I see. If I'm on Azure, then make these calls. Okay. Is, there, is there anything existing that could help me with that? Uh, the FOG library itself will you know, have certain capabilities and you know, it can differentiate between you know, OpenStack vanilla and it running on you know, HP or um, rack space or any of those sorts of things which have different capabilities, but there's no intelligence behind that. You just need to know what you're running on. Um, you know, so the, I don't think there's necessarily a, a magic solution for that at the moment. I don't know if that's something that really makes sense, does it? I mean, it's... So, so, the, so the key to, to that is first to start off with abstraction. So let's, you know, for example, let's say you have an application that is um, interacting with a key value data store, and so you're using simple DB in Amazon. So when most other clouds, <laughs> in, in most other clouds, you don't have an analog to that. Uh, so I mean, so you could you could do something like I mean, so Dasein Cloud has a metadata capabilities description thing that would allow you to know, okay, this cloud I'm in doesn't have uh, have a key value database, but that doesn't help you if the cloud doesn't have a key value database. What you really need is uh, to have your application talking to an abstraction, some sort of basic um, interaction API that if if it's an Amazon, it will talk to, to simple DB. Uh, otherwise, it will provision a VM and bring up React and, or you know something else and talk to React. So the application itself is completely ignorant of the fact that it may or may not be using a cloud uh, key value data store. Um, 
it's in my opinion, it's 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 better to have. Uh, I mean, this may be a little self-serving. I think you should need you need uh, orchestration up there, so that you have less logic sitting uh, in, in the application. But without orchestration, you need that abstraction there that that makes it not care about that. Uh, I would like to differentiate between uh, most of the cloud APIs, which are more administrative in nature, okay, provisioning stuff, configuring stuff, and uh, what uh, so some of what you're referring to is more like uh, programmatic APIs for actually accessing data, etc. So um, I think there's there's nothing new in that kind of exercise of abstracting, for example, databases or even abstracting relational databases versus uh, object-oriented applications. Uh, ORM tools exist for a long time, and, and as a developer, you, you should know that there's always a price, there's always a penalty and a trade-off in using layers of abstraction, and that, that is performance. And again, as, as I think uh, was said before, not all applications uh, created equal. From an administrative perspective, I think all of what we discussed in this panel applies. I, th I think uh, external orchestration that can handle the, difference, the differences between in behavior applies both during setup and later uh, for scale, for remediation, and so on. Randy, did you want to add anything to this discussion here? <laughs> um, I feel like I'm lighting a fuse. <laughs> discoverability is not what it should be in these systems. Um, there's a challenge there because, you know, the API is basically an explicit contract about what you can expect from the system, but because of the nature of any kind of system, you can't model the entire system in the API. Like it's only a snapshot or a window into uh, behavior that you've decided to expose, behavior that you haven't decided to expose may not be in there. So an example is, why can't I call a cloud API right now and say, spin up a VM in five minutes, and if it doesn't spin up in five minutes, kill it and give me a VM in five minutes again, right? You can't do that. You can't actually bake the SLA into the API call. You have to learn the, a bunch of the behaviors through trial and error. It's like a discovery process. and so. The, a lot of the cloud providers and, and a lot of the cloud systems don't actually provide the discoverability that would be necessary so that you can do that, what you're asking, in a, in a way that is more programmatic and makes sense. Instead, you know, it's a manual trial and error process. You've got to use JClouds or Fog or something like that, and you've got to sort of figure out how to determine which cloud you're on and then change your behavior through business logic, and you have to do each of those little pieces one at a time as you're trying to make, a, you know, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. It, uh, it reminds me, can you maybe take the mic over there? Reminds me a bit of writing a bash script for Linux and you're not even sure what flavor of Linux you're going to run it on. Uh, and so you have to do a bunch of little tricks to find out, you know, maybe using uname or, or whatever, or looking at some particular files for particular distributions. If they're there, okay, well now I'm using, I should use apt-get or I should use yum or whatever. It's obviously probably a little more complicated in the cloud, but just made me think of that. So we have time for one more question, yeah. and go right ahead. And it's a dumb question, you know. <laughs> uh, Perfect. I, I have a customer in Vietnam, and they are using Cloud Stack, and they're telling me that oh, Open Stack is good, and but it doesn't matter because in the future they will probably move from Cloud Stack to Open Stack. What I find is that J Clouds actually don't support Cloud Stack. Uh, so what does it take to, for Cloud Stack to be in J Clouds or? Um, J Clouds supports Cloud Stack. Do it, they do? It, do you do? Mike. Yarn, Mike. Oh, I can't find yeah, it on the I website. So, so actually, by giving the J Clouds layer, then they can move it from Cloud Stack to Open Stack easily, right? If they're using that that portable abstraction layer, but go ahead. Yeah, and if if they're using the the common denominator. Yeah, I. Uh, one of the thing, I guess, one of the things I don't like about J Clouds is that you can write against an abstraction or not, and and, and it, but uh, you know, Dasein Cloud supports both, and uh, and it's fully abstracted. So you write it, and it works against one; it'll just work against the other. There's no, uh, as long as you make, you know, the proper metadata checks for capabilities. 
Yeah, I think the different, yeah, like the way you summed up the difference between jclouds and, and the multi-cloud manager, um, I think there's just different use cases. Well, that's Dazine Cloud, not multi -cloud. Dazine. Yeah. Dazine, oh, Dazine oh, Cloud's. Dazine Cloud's an open source product. Right. Yeah. So uh, you're welcome to try Cloudify to port between uh, CloudStack and OpenStack. Quick one. Just, just one more. Um, so I, I have no idea about JClouds and obviously first time at OpenStack. I know it's mostly about compute network storage, right? So my question is, um, we talk about application portability. At the beginning, you said we should decouple it from, from the specific cloud that we expect, right? Normally, our applications are not directly communicating with network, compute, and storage, right? They are communicating with things like queuing and, you know, my execution layer and so on, which is the kind of RDS and all this kind of stuff which goes into password, right? So mostly what I heard here was issues around behavior, around um, non-functionals effectively for porting applications, for actually bringing them up, right? Which do you guys think uh, that, that application in the future, they will actually I'm, I'm talking about business logic applications, right? Will they actually query and execute these calls by themselves? So are we actually talking about not really the, 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 the standardization or non-standardization in the application code itself, or are we talking about the existing non-standardization in the behavior of the clouds that we have today? Because at the end of the day, if you talk about service, and I mean, we talk IES, right? Infrastructure as a service. A service is always defined, as I guess you said, about functionals and non-functions, right? And if we don't test against that, right, if we don't make policies and, 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 and basically promises on how quickly these things are, how quickly these things execute, then obviously we are not compliant, right? Right. So if you would do that, if we would ever be able to do that, right, like let's say provision in that space, as you said, right, I mean, and the application code is decoupled from these specific IAS cores, then wouldn't we have portability? Um, I think, you know, in a world that, that uh, did have common behaviour and, and this sort of testing, I mean, perhaps in just an OpenStack world, um, you shouldn't have to really worry about those sorts of things, but I think it's never quite that ideal. And if you're moving between AWS and, and OpenStack or CloudStack or anything else, you know, I think there is a lot of testing, a lot of consideration needs to go into a, an application designed to be running across multiple clouds. I don't know if there's any way to get around it. But, um, Last comments from yeah, anyone else? I guess I'd say, like, if, if, especially if you're running, like, legacy-type applications, um, the differences in networking among all the clouds is enough to, to screw you up big time. Uh, you, you know, uh, I mean, with, new, with, with properly architected, designed-for-failure applications, you can get away with it. But if you're talking like I'm deploying SAP or Exchange or something like that, the indeterminacy of the structure of the network and the behavior of the network alone makes portability really, really problematic. And Randy, you can play us out. So um, I think that what's key is to understand that um, it's about the application management framework. Like George's job is easier, or Design's job is easier, or JCloud's job is easier if there are some flavors you can rely on, right? I mean, who's running Slackware on their servers today? Mandrake Linux, Gen 2, okay, right. So there, you're running Ubuntu, you're running CentOS, you're, or Red Hat, you're running SUSE, right? I mean, that's the deal. There's emergent winners, and then we all standardize on that. Now, I, I'm, I'm a BSD guy. I wasn't happy that Linux won. You know, I was pretty unhappy about that, right? But I, but I gave it up because I knew the value of everybody running off basically the same flavor of stuff, right? And so you can build these abstraction layers and get application portability if you know you've only got two or three things that you need to make it work against. Then you can have your if Red Hat, you know, yum, you know, if Ubuntu, you know, app get. Hope I got that right. Um, <laughs> yeah, pretty sure I did. Um, hasn't been that long since I touched Linux. Um, but the point is, is that then, then you don't have this combinatorial matrix of problems that the application deployment and management framework has to solve. I mean, George's problem, and he and I was, were commiserating about this before, is that he'd go from one cloud stack, I'm putting words in your mouth, George, one cloud stack deployment to another, and the network worked differently, even though it's the same software and stuff started breaking. 
but if we were making CloudStack or OpenStack or whatever work by different flavors, then you know when you went to the AWS flavor, you get AWS networking, and that would be the same from one to the next. And then you just have to check, am I on a cloud with AWS networking? Oh, I am. Okay, great. Expect this. And I think that's just what I want people to understand. Is like we're, we're almost there. It's just people have to stop making snowflakes, right? As long as all the clouds are snowflakes, I mean, we're kind of screwing the pooch, right? It's like everybody makes and builds their own car. I mean, what, I mean we don't do our own Linux distri distribution, do we? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense if you stop and think about it. But we're all such special snowflakes. We are. <laughs> so um, we're, we're out of time here. Um, thank you so much, guys. I think one of the things that I've personally really taken away from the panel is the, the behavioral aspect of application portability. That's, uh, I find that really valuable, and, and we'll see what happens with RefStack and OpenStack and what emerges. So very interesting. Thank you very much, guys, and thank you all for joining us.